Module four, day four, begin at the range equation on page 115 and stop after doing on your own questions four, five, four, six, and four, seven on page 120. Although the problems that we just did should have been instructive, they really aren't all that useful. It turns out that I gave you more information than you needed in each of the examples and on your own problems presented in the previous section. When we analyze a two-dimensional situation, we can usually learn a piece of information by analyzing one of the dimensions and then using that information to help us analyze something in the other dimension. To see what I'm talking about, let's look at this situation from the On Your Own uh, 4.3. In this situation, I asked you to calculate the time that it took for the projectile to reach its maximum height. Although that is an interesting piece of information, it's not all that useful to the person firing the projectile. After all, the person firing the projectile needs to know where to aim the cannon so that the projectile will land on the enemy ship. Thus, the really useful piece of information we should seek is the distance that the projectile will travel in the X dimension. This will tell us whether or not the projectile will hit the enemy ship. When we calculate the distance that the projectile travels in the X dimension, we usually say that we are calculating the range of the projectile. How can we do this? In the On Your Own 4.4, we actually did determine the range of the projectile. So let's look at On Your Own 4.4. How can we do this? In On Your Own Problem 4.4, we actually did determine the range of the projectile. In this problem, we use the initial velocity and the time to determine the distance that a basketball traveled in the X dimension. In other words, we determine the range of the basketball. Now, although that was a useful exercise to go through, it wasn't all, all that applicable to the real world. After all, it is hard for someone firing a projectile or throwing a basketball to know how long the projectile will be in the air. The person firing the gun on the ship, for example, only knows the initial velocity of the projectile. Does that mean he or she will never be able to determine where to aim the cannon since one of the pieces of data required to calculate the range is missing? Of course not. Think about both of the on your own problems we have been discussing and think of them together. In on your own problem 4.3, you were given you were able to calculate the time it took for the projectile to reach its maximum height when you were given nothing but the initial velocity. I pointed, in, I pointed out in the solution to that problem that if you double your answer, you get the total time the projectile was in the air. So given just the initial velocity, you were able to determine the total time it took for the projectile to travel to its destination. So what did you do in On Your Own Problem 4.4? Given the initial velocity and the time it took for the ball to reach the destination, you calculated the ball's range. Now think about it. In On Your Own, Problem 4.4, I didn't really need to give you the total time that the ball was in the air. You could have determined that yourself by calculating the time it took for the ball to reach its maximum height. If you doubled that answer, you would have calculated the time that I originally gave to you. Do you see what I'm talking about here? In order to calculate the range of the projectile, you need to concentrate on the X dimension. Before you can do that, however, you need the total time it takes for the projectile to reach its destination. You can calculate that by looking at the Y dimension. In other words, you examine the Y dimension first in order to get a crucial piece of information, and then you analyze the X dimension. That's how you can determine the range of any projectile when you are given just the initial velocity. I'm going to use this idea to develop a general equation that can be used to calculate the range of any projectile that lands at the same height from which it was fired. In order to develop a general equation, I'm not gonna use numbers in the derivation. I'm going to assume that someone told me the initial velocity of the projectile, but I'm not going to use a number for it. Instead, I will refer to the initial speed as VO. Here we go. It is not in boldface um, because speed is not a vector. And the angle, remember, speed and angle together make velocity as theta. Furthermore, I will assume that theta is between 0 and 90 degrees. 
Using these two symbols for the initial velocity of the projectile, I will now develop a general equation for the range of the projectile. Since we know the initial velocity, we can determine its y component. So we're going to call that v o v naught y, the initial velocity of the y component, equals v naught times the sine of theta. Now that we know the initial velocity in the y dimension, we can calculate the time it takes for the projectile to reach its maximum height. After all, we know that the y component of its velocity will be zero at the maximum height and we know that the acceleration in the y dimension is simply due to gravity. In order to keep things completely general, we will refer to the acceleration due to gravity as g. That way we can use either 9.8 meters per second squared or 32 feet per second squared, depending on the units of the problem. So we have initial velocity, final velocity, and acceleration. From that information, we need to calculate time. And this calls to our, one of our very important equations from module two, this one. Now I will substitute in the things I know. Please note that I will list the acceleration as negative g. I will do this because in the end, I want the value for g to be positive. However, the acceleration is negative in this situation. So I need to include the negative sign explicitly. Zero equals initial speed times the sine of theta plus negative g times t. Now we are going to solve for t, which gives us the initial velocity or the initial speed v naught times the sine theta over g. Since I'm assuming that theta is between zero and 90 degrees, we know that this equation will always be positive, which is good since time must always be positive. So now we know how long it takes for the projectile to reach its maximum height. That's not quite what we need to know, however. We really need to know how much total time the projectile is in the air. But remember, when a projectile lands at the same height from which it was fired, it reaches its maximum height exactly halfway along its journey. This means that the total time the projectile is in the air is simply twice the time we just calculated. So the total time is two times the time to reach maximum height, which is halfway. So the total time is two times the initial speed times sine theta over gravity. So you see, we didn't need to be told the time the projectile was in the air. We just had to calculate it from some of the things we knew about the y dimension of the problem. Now that we have this information, we can move to the x dimension. We need to know the distance that the projectile travels in the x dimension. In order to calculate this, we have some data. We just calculated the time it takes for the projectile to travel. We can also calculate the x component of the initial velocity. Finally, we also know that in the x dimension, Acceleration is zero for any projectile. So we have time, initial velocity, and acceleration. We need to calculate displacement from one of our module two equations. Equation 2.19 will do the trick. To use this equation, we need to substitute in the things that we know. The initial velocity, remember we're in the x dimension now, is given by equation 4.6. The acceleration is zero and the time is given by equation 4.5. Substituting these things into equation 2.19 gives us this whole thing right here. In the end then, equation 4.7 is one way that we can calculate the range of a projectile given just its initial velocity, v naught and theta. I wanna do a couple of things to this equation though before we're finished. First, rather than calling our answer delta x, I call it range, because that's what we're really solving for here. Second, I want to make the equation a little more compact. In trigonometry, sine of theta equals, or times the cosine of theta equals sine two theta over two. If you didn't learn that, don't worry. It's simply an equation. It says that anywhere we see sine theta times cosine theta, we can substitute sine of two theta over two, 
I will use this substitution in equation 4.7. These two changes turn our range equation into this right here. Thus, if we are given the initial velocity of a projectile, we can determine its range by simply using this equation. Now remember, I assume that theta was between zero degrees and 90 degrees in this derivation. So this equation is valid only for angles within that range. Now, before I go on to show you an example of how to use this equation, let me get a couple of things straight. First, because I put a negative sign on the acceleration due to gravity in equation 4.2, you do not have to use a negative number for gravity in this equation. That's already taken into account. Second, this equation does not apply to all two-dimension projectiles. I cannot emphasize this point too strongly. Students see this range equation and think that they can apply it to all situations. However, it doesn't work that way. Since we assumed in the derivation that the projectile is going to land at the height from which it was launched, this equation only works for those kinds of projectiles. If a projectile lands at a height other than from which it was launched, this equation does not apply. Please remember these two things. Here you go. Gravitational acceleration is always positive in this equation. Also, this equation applies only to projectiles that land at the same height from which they are launched. On your own, 4.5. A cannon is tilted at an angle of 42 degrees relative to the ground. If the cannon launches its projectile with an initial speed of 150 meters per second, what is the range of the, of the cannonball on level ground. This is a simple application of our new equation, equation 4.9. I've written it right here. We are given the uh, V naught or the initial speed of 150 meters per second and the, and the angle theta of 42 degrees. From those facts, we are asked to calculate the range of the projectile. So here's the equation that we're gonna do. I've went ahead and done some of the math just to make sure you guys are doing good with your calculators. The cannon, so the cannonball's range is 2.3 times 10 to the third meters. On your own, 4.6. A missile is aimed at an angle of 23 degrees relative to the ground. If the missile's target is 5.4 times 10 to the fourth meters away, and at the same elevation, at which speed must the missile launch in order to hit it? In this, in this use of equation 4.9, we are given the angle theta of 23 degrees and the desired range of 5.4 times 10 to the fourth meters. We need to determine the necessary initial speed, V naught. Thus, we just need to rearrange equation 4.9 to solve for V naught after we have plugged in the numbers that we know. So we're trying to figure out at what speed. So here's our equation. We're trying to solve for V naught. I put V naught squared. You can, you can put it however you would like. So V naught squared equals the range times gravity over the sine of two theta. So in putting all of the information, I went ahead and did some of the math on the calculators for you just to make sure you guys knew what you were doing. We get an initial speed of 8.6 times 10 to the second meters per second. So in order to hit its target, the missile must have an initial velocity of 8.6 times 10 to the second meters per second. On your own, 4.7. A rifle shoots its bullet with an initial speed of 2.00 times 10 to the 2 feet per second. At what angle should a marksman aim his rifle to hit a target that is 5.00 times 10 to the second feet away and at the same height as the rifle? In this application of equation 4.9, we are given the initial speed and the desired range. So we have the initial speed, the desired range, and gravity. With this information, we must calculate the angle at which the rifle should be aimed. To do that, we will plug in our numbers and then rearrange the equation to solve for theta. Before we do this, however, notice that the units are in feet and seconds. So this tells us that we need to use 
the gravity of 32 feet per second squared for the acceleration due to gravity so that the units will be consistent. So put all your information in the equation. We come to here, 0 0.40 is the sine of two theta. You have to take the inverse sine on both sides to be able to continue at this step. So we have the inverse sine of 0 0.40 equals two theta. So the inverse sine of 0 0.40 is 23.57817 da, 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 equals two theta. To solve for theta, we divide both sides by two and we get theta equals 12 degrees.